Hello there and welcome to another episode of Radio Miles, the Flan O'Brien podcast poised between pub and peer review with me, your host, Toby Harris. This episode is part two of my interview with Maeve Long, a multi-award winning scholar of Flan O'Brien who is the editor of his collected letters. In this episode, we talk in depth about Brian and Olin, originality, cash, technology, and we play for the very first time a newly unearthed recording of O'Nolan's voice. What he has to say and how he says it is sensational. So without further ado, let's dive back in. He is a, a man who had to begin so many times. I mean, he, he's a, and, and maybe, I mean, we've talked about him being prescient and we've talked about him kind of both being um of his time, but also applicable to, to, to our contemporary. And I think, you know, in, in this period of, of quiet quitting and in this period of, of skepticism about the jobs that we do, I think O'Nolan was very, very prescient in that way. Like he, he's always early and belated, this, this man. He's always kind of ahead of the curve and then slightly out out of sync with the, with the curve. So... um. I think that when it comes to kind of the, the continuity versus uh, new beginnings of his work, I mean, obviously we can see a style that is relatively recognizable. There's a, there's a certain turn of phrase, there's a certain type of humor that runs through his work. But if you read The Hard Life and Swim Two Birds, or particularly kind of The Third Policeman, The Hard Life, back to back, they, they could seem like a very different author. I mean, there there is obviously the gap of years and the gap of, of health and alcoholism. Um, but there's a, a huge stylistic difference. So, so he is a man who kind of wrote novels, wrote novels in English, wrote novels in Irish, kind of sold but didn't sell enough, had to begin again. So then he turned to playwriting, kind of had some successes, but not perhaps the successes he deserved. Meanwhile, he's also doing the columns. Meanwhile, he's also kind of hustling for jobs in other newspapers. So he, he is a man of precarity in that sense. He is a man of a, a precarious period and, and that precarity is forcing him to begin again and again and again. Um, his, his sense of starting off with something that is, again, if we're suspicious about the word parody, if not a parody of Joyce, then a kind of a, a springboarding from Joyce and it's Swim Two Birds and a, and a kind of a, a very competent um, and I think both parodic and respectful use of of Irish texts to then to this kind of text that is that's, you know it's, uh, the third policeman that is I don't know murder and fantasy and a police procedural but with also elements of I don't know either kind of fantasy is the wrong word but definitely a sense of kind of the the surreal and the the supernatural then we have a novel in Irish that is a parody uh, kind of a, but a, then also a kind of a playful homage to texts mm -hmm. like Antilonach. So in a way he actually reminds me of China Mievel um, mm -hmm. because China Mievel once said that he basically wanted to kind of write a book in every genre that there was. So he was going to write fantasy, he was going to write a police procedural and so on. And I mean Mievel's style is, is very recognizable throughout. So the kind of the, the genres then become kind of placeholders, I suppose, or, or conventions that he works with and undercuts. And that's kind of what I think O'Nolan does. Yes, there are genre differences in the work that he does. And from that perspective, we can see him as being very original. And, and we can also see him as, like I said, beginning again with every work. But of course, there are continuities. So it's, it's kind of like the apple and oranges thing. On the one hand, apple and oranges are very different. And on the other hand, they're both fruit. <laughs> you can see difference or you can see continuity, depending on the angle that you wish to take. I, I think we, we're also edging around um, this topic of um, Flan O'Brien and, and popular culture, maybe mm. hit the route that he took um, as opposed to um, a, a, a more, you might call it a more high modernist route of appealing to a very niche audience with very experimental work. Whereas, as you've mentioned, that he is playing with um, genres like a police procedural that form, you know, the mainstay of a lot of popular reading and writing. Um, can you say a little bit about your your take on what his project and how it um, how it clashes with or how it appeals to to popular mass culture? <laughs> 
This is also something that we've been circling around because we've we've talked about kind of the utopian idea of a collective versus the 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 troubles that come in when you try to turn something into intellectual property and need to get paid from it, where originality is linked to a kind of a, a cash value and that somebody's name has to be on the paycheck. Um, and I, I think it's the same in this instance with the kind of the desires for artistic play or the breaking down of boundaries or a kind of a very real questioning in, in the, the student narrator's manifesto at its from two birds sense of what is originality how do mm -hmm. we engage with a novel what is borrowing does that matter mm -hmm. um versus the sense of wanting to sell books so this is a, a circular way a roundabout way of saying that I, I think he was really pulled between an aesthetic desire to break boundaries and an aesthetic desire to try new things and a very real need to make money. And I mean, I don't think that's restricted to him. I think every author has the right to be paid for um, the work that they do. And in a way that the sad thing actually is that these days it seems less and less possible for people to actually make a living by only being an author. Whereas it was a little bit more possible, particularly in the 19th century and kind of moving into the early 20th. Yeah. So, I mean, we have many letters where he talks about the kind of the cash value of his texts and many letters where he says that he's not interested in literature. He just wants to make money. Um, those discussions increase as he ages and increase, obviously, as his situation is, is more precarious. So once he loses a job in the civil service, um, these texts do, in a sense, have to make money. And that line of, I'm just going to write books that are ostensibly checkbooks is something that he repeats over and over again, actually. Mm -hmm. It's, it's yeah. a bad joke, but a, a joke that he, he clearly feels quite deeply because it's something that is, is so often uh, repeated, so often something that he falls back on. So I suppose from a, from a scholar's perspective, um, Obviously, I would prefer the experimental, and and I, I can make no no secret of the fact that the the while we can appreciate the great play and and see much brilliance in the Shaggy Dog stories of Keats and Chapman and so on, that the texts that appeal to me are the 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 more complicated, more experimental texts. I, I'm not a big fan of of the later texts like The Hard Life. Like even though he thought of them as better, and even though, though later in life he was incredibly dismissive of its, of its swim two birds, mm -hmm. like he repeatedly says in the letters that he simply cannot understand the appeal. He dismisses it as juvenilia. He he dismisses it as just the kind of the the slightly deranged rants of of a university student. But I mean, this is a classic example of, I, I think, an author uh, misinterpreting their own work. Like he, 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 he was wrong, I think, in there, putting there so is much a, value. Sorry. There is a brief moment and it's like much of the, the letters, it's, it's hard to restore the full context and understand how much of a joke this is. But where he refers to the experience of reading at Swim Two Birds in French translation, and he says this kind of reinvigorates his interest in his own work, reading it in yeah. a new language. <laughs> yeah, it's a good point. Um, yeah, because he, he is usually in the later letters really quite dismissive of the text, but you're right, kind of reading it in translation did make it seem fresh and new to him. So, I mean, maybe that's simply it, that he, he'd kind of lived with that book in proximity or in distance for so many decades that he, he'd just gotten fed up of it. And I think there was also, again, uh, he had committed to a relatively different style for the hard life and to an extent for the Dorky archive. And I think it just made sense to him to be committed to the new version of himself rather than somehow, I'm going to say first and then I'll, I'll, I'll qualify it, rather than recreate an old version of himself. Of course, that's exactly what he went on to do in the Dalkey Archive, because he recreates an old version of himself by plundering material from the unpublished third policeman and turning it into the Dalkey Archive. But he does so in a way that really aligns the text more to the hard life than to the work of the kind of the late 30s and 40s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so at that point, he's he's happened upon a, a style which he's he's kind of happier with. Um, yeah, and that he actually believes in, and again, to bring us back to this conversation about money, thinks thinks will will make money for him, thinks will sell books. 
Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my my favorite um, money making scheme or project, I think, um, completely unrealized was his plan to write a book called uh, Glorious Ireland Then and Now oh, yes. and sell it to an American publisher demanding, I think he, there is a letter to an American publisher where he says, I need a $5,000 advance <laughs> to begin yeah, yeah. work on this. <laughs> I mean, and this is, again, like, this is the hustle. We, we talk so much about the contemporary hustle, but he, he was having to hustle. And I suppose, particularly perhaps for an Irish and British audience where we're still a little uncomfortable talking about money and we, we still have this this sense of the kind of the, the sacrality of the work and the, the, de the debasement of, of cash. I think sometimes reading letters where he's hustling is a bit painful, but I, I think perhaps that's that's an easy bias that you can have when you're not the one desperately trying to bring money into the house. I, I think it's just important to understand and it, it's an intersection that exists in even the most um, uh, esoteric and seemingly protected work. You know, there, there's there's plenty of research that's now been done into um, the institutional structures and markets that enabled um, James Joyce and other of the high modernists to build a market around their work and how how interested they were in financial structures that could support exactly. them. It's just exactly. part of it. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that, that's a really good point, because it also kind of brings me back to a question you asked about the selection and the annotation of the letters. And so one thing I wanted to do with the letters project was to make as many letters uh, accessible to scholars and readers as I possibly could, and not to be too bound by the things that I find fascinating. So for, for example, there are a series of letters uh, about banking <laughs> and not a kind of uh, intellectual reflection on the nature of banking, but they are, they are banking letters. They're letters <laughs> to his banker. And I don't find those particularly interesting, but I have friends who get exceedingly excited about Joyce and banking. And so I wanted to make sure that whatever direction future, future research went in, that scholars wouldn't kind of have to turn to the letters and go, oh, look, there's a gap there. Now we have to once again fly to Boston or fly to Carbondale to, to find these. And that also kind of matched uh, the commitment about the annotation. So there's really no standard best practice as to the way you present letters or kind of what scaffolding you have with them. Kind of so, I've checked so many letters projects and they all do slightly different things. So you can either decide to have a completely bare page, really, with, with no apparatus around it and just present the letter, or you can have varying degrees of annotation, which you can have as a footnote, you can have after the letter, you can have at the back of the book. There is, there's you know, numerous ways of doing that. But in the course of tracking down and assembling and ordering the letters in finding out kind of who they're from and when they were written, because those things are not always clear, you do end up with a huge amount of research and a huge amount of knowledge about the positions of the letters that can get lost even to you, because as an academic, as, as, as you know, I mean, we're doing so many things at the same time. So we're mm -hmm. not just researchers, we're also teachers, we're not just lecturing, we're also administrating and, and so on. So what I wanted to make sure was that that knowledge wouldn't be lost and it seemed like the most accessible place to put it was in the footnotes and so when mm -hmm. I found out information about kind of the Sexton Blake um, speculation when there was information about kind of tension between Montgomery and O'Nolan around kind of potential plagiarism later on at life when there's kind of more information that I have about the letters controversy in the 30s it seemed only fair and right to make that accessible to scholars and the most kind of sensible place to do that was was in the notes. And I can attest to the usefulness of uh, your choices <laughs> on that apparatus. Um, in the past, in recent years, I've, you know, fin written a, a PhD on Flann O'Brien and multiple articles. And the letters was all is always the book on my desk uh, next to me as I work. <laughs> and if I go to work somewhere else, it's ba it's always the book I take with me, not the collected <laughs> novels. Yeah. So if I'm going to the British Library or something, I, I'm working on an article about that. And that's that's what I would want. So it really is that that reference point. Oh, that's um, wonderful to hear. I'm, I'm delighted. So success in that sense. Um, um, <laughs> I wanted to ask a bit more about um, technology and and Brian and Nolan, Flann O'Brien, um, specifically uh, typewriters. So not only is he a writer of the typewriter, you know, rather than a written manuscript, the handwritten manuscript, 
He also took an active interest in typewriters and how they were manufactured, how good they were, and in typefaces as well. Um, mm. So can you talk a bit more about um, what you think the, the the impact of the typewriter as a technology is on, on Flann O'Brien and his body of work? So without sending us too much kind of away from Onolan to talk about theories of, of typewriters, but they're, they're there and they're fascinating, should anyone wish to pursue <laughs> them. But Friedrich Kittler, who's kind of the, um, I don't know, the, the grandfather of, of theory around typewriters, basically writes about what he calls media determinism. And it, it's, it's basically the idea that the, the mode of inscription or the, the mode of creating the text has an influence on the text itself. And it's hard for me to describe this to you when there's just an audio, because it's easier when I can kind of show people. But, mm -hmm. but basically his argument was that if you think about the way in which you write when you're holding a pen or a pencil, like it, it is attached to your hand and you look at the page where your hand and your pen are. So you're kind of almost kind of curled around the page. If you think about the way you'd sit and the way you would hold your pen, it's kind of almost brought into kind of, you know, presumably you're sitting at a table, but nonetheless, your legs are underneath it, your body's over it, you're kind of encompassing it. Mm -hmm. And you're also, yeah, your eyes are on the text. But if you think about the way your body is when you type, depending on your aptitude as a typist, if you're a bad typist, you're looking at your fingers, which means that you're not looking at the text. Or if, a good, if you're a good typist, you're looking at the piece of paper, but it means you're not looking at your fingers. So either way, you're disconnected from the mode of creation. You're not actually kind of as, as physically, um, there's not the same physical flow through from between you and the words. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, and this is also something that really appeals to me because I've, I've had a longstanding in, in, uh, interest in, in fragmentation. Mm -hmm. But when you think about the way you type, if you look at kind of the keyboard that may or may not be in front of you right now, basically what you have is a device that has given you the alphabet and all of the kind of the other scaffolding that you need in terms of numbers and, and symbols. And you assemble your words through kind of typing in order particular letters. So basically what the typewriter or computer keyboard does is, is turn the act of inscription into an act of codifying or assembling letters from kind of individual buttons and assembling them into a word, which basically means that when we're typing, we're moving kind of already and intimately, though that word is, is problematic itself, but we're deeply embedded in a space of um, assemblage, but also anagrams. In other words, the fact that you can, uh, you're, you're choosing from a series of letters means that you are admitting the fact that you could choose differently, that the letters can be assembled differently. And you're also in a space where you can introduce an error that doesn't stem from education or lack of knowledge. Like with your handwriting, you can't, there's no typos in handwriting. You mm. either know how to spell the word or you don't. And if you don't know how to spell it, you look it up. But you can't really accidentally misspell it whereas you can accidentally misspell things on a typewriter. So it, it gives us a very different relationship with the text, with what we produce, with the nature of words themselves. And, and basically that, Kittler's argument is, is that it moves us from a sense of words as, as wholes, words as kind of present to themselves that have identity and meaning imbued in them, to a slightly more kind of post-structuralist sense of, of words as lacking presence, as words that can be at any point assembled and reassembled differently, as always kind of distant to themselves and distant to the person creating them. Um, and that to me, I think gives us some really interesting insights to the arguments that O'Nolan makes in At Swim Two Birds. And I've written a piece on this, but, but basically my argument is that if you look at the different authors in the text, they actually use different implements. So the student narrator types trellis as this kind of liminal figure, both types and uses a pencil. Mm -hmm. And then Orlik, his creation, only uses a pen. And mm -hmm. as we move from typewriters to this liminal in-between space to pens, we're actually moving from 
a type of authorship that is invested in a lack of originality, in the sense of borrowing, in assembling, in bringing pieces in whenever you find them useful, to when we get to Orlok, who basically wants to torture and kill his father by writing about it. But the point is, is that because he's kind of embodied or imbued with this sense of presence, his act of writing through this continuity of the self and the pen is not writing a novel, but actually writing the real life torture of his father. So he's not representing torture, he mm -hmm. is torturing. Mm. And that moves us basically kind of from a sense of the modernity of the narrator to the, the realism of, and I use that in the sense of kind of the, the realist novel, but a kind of a, a sense of a relationship with a text where we also, we kind of ostensibly kill literature and that literature is not literature it is actually real life effect we're, we're reading through it mm -hmm. um but of course at the end of at swim two birds orlick and everyone else are destroyed when the pages on which they're uh, they're written are burned and so the novel then ends really with a kind of return to the typewriter a return to this sense of assemblage and i mean there there if we had more time there's all kind of nuance i would put on that but Basically, to me, that's the movement, and that's the kind of the the, the point of interest between you know, the typewriter and the pen. Absolutely, um, and I, I don't even want to sully your fantastic analysis by attempting to layer on too much of my own um, own opinion and, and view onto it. But suffice to say that I think your work and the work of others is showing us just how how useful um, Flann O'Brien's work is uh, to read this the role of of technology and and thinking and how those things evolve together and and off each other which is surely one of the most important um contemporary themes we have to contend with in the world today absolutely and i mean by the time o'nolan was was writing uh, the typewriter was no longer new tech like shockingly new technology um so we can think of maybe dracula if we're thinking of a, a another irish anglo-irish writer mm -hmm. um like we can see Jennifer Wick has written about Dracula as kind of a, a deeply modern novel in its early engagement with the effect of, of, of typewriters. But by the 30s, typewriters were relatively normalized. Um, but what's interesting, I think, is then not just that he was embracing something new, but that he was embracing something that had become normalized within society and thinking through the implications of it. I mean, there's some great columns where he, he talks about kind of the individual called Remington, who mm -hmm. due to various health conditions has yeah. replaced uh, most of his insides with typewriters. And so he is then not only the embodiment of a typewriter, but there is also a kind of a fully functional typewriter inside him. <laughs> and that sometimes sporadically, this, this typewriter would just spew out racing tips <laughs> so, <laughs> so we have this sense of kind of the the machine made man and the man made machine. So and they're in this kind of weird symbiotic relationship where where Remington is both controlling the typewriter and controlled by the typewriter. And it's really again, if we're talking about prescience, so this really fascinating the kind of post human way. Mm -hmm. Because there's this constantly the sense of, well, who then is in control, kind of Remington or the typewriter, and where is the line where Remington ends and the typewriters begins, which is of course what the third policeman is about, kind of when when are we bicycles like how do we possibly navigate the line between kind of the sense of self and the sense of mechanical intervention so um at this point um with not much time left um we will keep on the technology theme and um i want to find out if you are able to uh play us a small segment of a recording that you have which was a lost and now found interview with uh flan o'brien and for, for context um this this is a, a an author who is very difficult to listen to there's this very little audio recording despite an extensive participation in radio yeah. um during his his lifetime um so are we are we still on to to do that mate uh yes i think so so this interview, uh, which is about 12 minutes long, um, is as of yet um, unspecifically dated. I have an approximate date for it, but I do not know the name of the interviewer and I don't know if it was aired or and if it was aired, where it was aired. Um, we do have access to 
listings on the BBC and listings on um, RTE, on, on uh, Radio Erin. But I can't find any listing that corresponds to the mentions made in the actual interview that date it. So basically, there is a clue given to us by the interviewer who says at one point, a headline in a recent article says, I must be shouting at my enemies. So the article that the interviewer is referring to is an interview of Flann O'Brien conducted by Michael Whale, and that was published in Town Magazine in September 1965. So, I mean, recent can be used in any number of ways, but uh, that basically means that the earliest this interview could have been is late September 1965, probably October, November. So we're talking about the last six months of O'Nolan's life. Of course, there's no guarantee that it was aired directly after it was actually recorded, and there's no guarantee it was aired at all. Um, the reason I have this recording is that in the process of kind of doing the letters, uh, this was sent to me. And it was sent to me in one of those kind of casual ways where somebody says, oh look, here, you know, I have this thing, I think you should really hear it, but you know, don't, don't pass it around. And so I didn't. Um, but kind of some, you know, quite a few years later, about five or six years later to, the, to today, we have this situation where people are beginning to work on Radio Miles, as this podcast is named, and beginning to work on the importance of the sound of an author's voice and how his radio presence or TV presence might be uh, examined and analysed. And people kept commenting on, on the fact that we the only audio recording that we have is um, in one in which O'Nolan is unfortunately very, very inebriated. And the trouble with that kind of resource is that there is, I think, a flattening that takes place when someone's drunk. In other words, a lot of drunk people just sound like drunk people as opposed to mm -hmm. kind of themselves. Yeah. Yeah. So it basically means that we then have access to a recording of O'Nolan where he is not O'Nolan. And I mean, I know that unfortunately by this time in his life, his his alcoholism was such that he was probably slightly drunk more than he was sober. Uh, John Garvin says it kind of both nicely and tragically when he says that there was nothing romantic about Brian's drinking. Mm -hmm. um, so we are dealing with somebody who, yeah, for whom this is a, a very serious and ongoing problem. But nonetheless, I still think it is right for us to have access to O'Nolan at his best rather than O'Nolan at his worst. Um, and I think it's only fair to the, 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 the text that he has written and then the genius of the individual for us to have some kind of way of, of hearing him when he is you know, more himself than he was when he was so horribly drunk in that interview with Tim Pat Coogan. In an ideal situation, I would have got back to the, the individual who sent me this file and asked them uh, if I could disseminate it because we'd now reached a point in scholarship where people were really strongly feeling the absence. And I, I, I think it was that I, I would think it was for the best for uh, scholarship. But unfortunately, because they have passed away, I, I can't ask them for permission. Um, it's then a difficult decision. What do you do when somebody sends you something uh, they, they say themselves that they don't know where it's from, they can't really remember who sent it to them, but they just kind of casually say, the way we often do, you know, don't, don't, don't pass it on. So it's hard to know how, how serious was that request, how, um, and, and why they made it, because there's nothing in the content of the interview that needs withholding. Um, there's, there's nothing defamatory, there's nothing surprising about his personal life. It's, it's a very standard kind of publicity interview, though that, he does say fascinating things for us, but there's, there's nothing that would need withholding because of content. And so I, I've made the difficult decision and I very much hope this doesn't dissuade anyone from ever sending me work in the future. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I made the difficult decision to disseminate it, knowing that the individual who sent it to me can't get in any, into any trouble. So so there, the, the, it's, it's, yeah. It's a tricky balance, but the the value to the scholarly community, I felt, outweighed the possible repercussions to this individual. And, and because they have passed away, they, they, they can't really be any. Um, 
So yeah, that's it. So we then have uh, 12 minutes of Brian O'Nolan, Flann O'Brien's actual voice. Um, we and if anybody listens to this and recognizes the the uh, voice of the interviewer, I would be so delighted if they could contact me because it would be really good if we could track this down. Listen, I, I should note that when it was sent to me, the quality was also really terrible, and I'm hugely grateful to one of the IT guys at my university, Oliver Stewart, for working on improving the sound. He, he, there's still a little bit of fuzz at the start and end, but I compared to the original, compared to what I was sent, this is just fabulous work. So I'm just going to play a short part from near the beginning of the interview. So you'll hear both the interviewer's voice and then O'Nolan's reply. So again, if anyone knows who this interviewer is, please do contact me. Well, are the attitudes of, of Brian O'Nolan, of Flann O'Brien and Miles Nagopoulin, uh, are they the same person? No, they have dissimilar uh, outlooks. And there are some other characters you haven't named, which I don't think should be named. A few other sort of work, other sorts of work. I think it's important to keep these personalities in their own places, their own compartments. There's another uh, personality, an Irish uh, writer, He's been fairly silent for a long time now. Well, to, to me, what's so fascinating about that is um, the slight mournfulness, I think, that comes through at the end when he says, you know, there's another personality of the Irish writer, but he's been silent for a long time. I mean, that 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 really cuts. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I need to uh, um, I need to. Once again, fight through how much my brain is melting uh, since this is the first time that I've been able to listen to this, um, listen to this recording. Um, and um, I agree that there's something uh, very fascinating about the about the tone and the the kind of um, poise that we capture mm -hmm. O'Nolan in at this point in his career. Um, and something that for me is is gold dust in some ways that that bespeaks a kind of sincerity to his project that's easy to lose. Yeah, exactly. Because so the only recording that we have is one in which he is in that bombastic drunken phase. And so in it, and it's it's freely available on YouTube, kind of both fortunately and unfortunately. Um, but he says that kind of he's read all the books and he speaks all the languages, but the only people, the reason people don't like him is because he's a gutty. And then, I mean, kind of interesting. He's like, I'm a, one of the plain people of Ireland. And it's just, yeah, it, like I said, it, it loses any specificity of character, really, because it's just at that, that drunken, I'm the king of the world kind of phase. And so if that's all we have, then the only version of O'Nolan that is available to us in the kind of with the immediacy of, of, of voice and, and image is a particular version of a man who was you know, a complex series of, of identities, a series of parts. And so, sure, there are very bombastic moments to the man. And he played with that very successfully with Miles Nagopoulin in, in the columns. But I don't think that was the core of who he was. And I think this this piece with the, the slightly slower tone, with the kind of the, the sense of a, a slightly more somber delivery and a little bit of, of mournfulness about what he might have lost, I think gives us a much better insight into the individual. And I think also has the effect of meaning that our scholarship has to take on board the serious side of O'Nolan sometimes. And it's it's perfectly all right and it's it's perfectly understandable that we sometimes get a little bit lost in the play of, of O'Nolan. But I, I think that should never um, occlude the, the seriousness of his, his intellectual endeavors. Absolutely. Um, and as the, um, as the impact of um, being able to listen to his voice in that way, saying those words, slowly reverberates through cyberspace. Um, I just want to uh, take this opportunity to um, Thank you so much, uh, May, for being on the podcast and sharing the material you have. I, I believe it makes this a somewhat historic occasion, at least in a small way. Uh, so yes, I'm so grateful. Uh, thank you so much for being with me on this podcast. Not at all. It was a real pleasure, Toby. I really very much enjoyed speaking about Anolan from technology to cash with you. <laughs>